Would you mind if, can I do this sitting down? Page and page and page. And also, I'm going to read it, but not too slavishly, because it's a complicated thing. And uh, we must try and get it right. Now, this is Marco. <coughs> I called, um, I called the, the, the talk um, The Eightfold Life of Marco Pallas. I hope it isn't a blasphemous thing to do in the context of the society. But it occurred to me that the eight principal strands of Marco's life could be neatly expressed in that way. So it's, it's simply a, a device. In his foreword to a Buddhist spectrum, published when he was 85, Marco Pallas noted that one of the most difficult things when writing a book is to find a good title, one which somehow expresses the nature of the work. And this is true not only of books, but of any attempt to convey as accurately as possible the nature of another human being. In Marco's case, it had been made much more difficult due to his habit of disposing of correspondence and other personal documents at intervals throughout his life. Mm -hmm. And after he died, the few remaining items were either destroyed or given to Marco's family and friends by Richard Nicholson, who had been his inseparable companion for more than 60 years. Even now, I still remember Marco Pallas as he was, that February evening in 1966 when I first saw him. Despite his grey hair and a tendency to stoop, he looked younger than I'd expected. He was a vegetarian, obviously very healthy, no taller than about five foot eight or five foot nine. He had a gentle expression dark eyes, dark eyebrows, a crooked nose, and a fairly pronounced chin. He spoke quietly, very precisely, and, as I recall at intervals, with the faintest trace of a Mediterranean accent, very attractive. Welcoming and attentive, he occasionally gave the impression of being somewhere else, but never that he was bored or disinterested by what was going on around him. Richard Nicholson, ten years younger than Marco, deferred to him in almost everything. He fetched the photograph albums Marco wanted to show me, and later a tray with tea and delicious iced biscuits. I remember that Richard urged me to accept photographs of Tibet, which Marco handed to me, saying, Marco wants you to have them. Unassuming, learned, and remarkably gifted, they could not have been kinder or more hospitable. It's possible that the Paris family didn't originate in Greece, but in Albania. As evidence of this in the 18th century under Ottoman rule, Juan Balanos Palace and his son Yanis held government posts open to Albanians but forbidden to Greeks. Furthermore, Marco Palace's father published a book of short stories in Liverpool, writing as Leko Arvaniti, which translates as Sandy the Albanian. Marco's maternal family, the Raleys, were descended from Norman ancestry and settled latterly off the Turkish coast on the island of Chios, documented so elegantly in Libro d'Oro de la Noblesse de Chios and other works by Philip Argenti. Anastasius Palace, Marco's uncle, was a governor of the Bank of Greece. Better then than now, perhaps. Anastasius' Anastasis's younger brother, Agamemnon, was a general and ADC to King George I of the Hellenes whilst Alexander, Marcus' father, who married Julia Raleigh, later became a director of Raleigh Brothers, whose prestigious merchant bank had already been established by John and Eustratio Raleigh four years before the massacre by the Turks in 1822 of 25,000 inhabitants of Kiosk. 
Alexander Palace, born in March 1851 in Perez, if I remember correctly, had managed his late cousin's small calico factory in Manchester since he was 19. Alexander's efficient performance at the city's cotton exchange resulted in an offer by Raleigh Brothers to work for them in India, provided that he agree to marry into the Raleigh family. And this he did in 1881, and soon after that he became a British citizen. Marco Alexander Pallas, who you see there on the right, the youngest of Alexander and Julia's five children was born on the 19th of June, 1895. He was a, an artistic and sensitive child, and according to his niece, Dominie Nichols, Marco was always his mother's favourite. One of Marco's sisters and two of his brothers were born in India. Marco and another sister, Aziza, were born in England. Alexander had bought his family's home at Egbeth Drive in Liverpool with its distinctive minaret from an Arab in 1894. He named the house Tatoy after a country residence owned by King George of the Hellenes. The younger generation of the family thought this was extremely odd, since Alexander, who was known to his children, his grandchildren, as Papu, grandfather, had always been a staunch Republican. From the summer term of 1908 until the spring term of 1910, Marco was educated at Harrow. He then returned home to Liverpool, where he was taught by private tutors. His father had translated the Iliad, and the New Testament into modern Greek, and read aloud at a church service in Athens, the New Testament caused uproar and bloodshed. Alexander's controversial translation nevertheless may have encouraged Marco, or Marco's fascination with the Bible, and he persuaded the school chaplain at Harrow to give him extra lessons in religion. For a while, he felt drawn to Catholicism until his mother intervened. She told the priest, if my son becomes a Roman Catholic, there will be no money. Age 16, Marco became passionately interested in entomology and travelled to British Guiana in 1911 to study the region's insects. In 1912, he joined the Greek campaign against the Ottoman Empire in the First Balkan War, and during the siege of Ionina, the palace family's ancestral town, Marco worked in a field hospital south of Ionina at Arta, near the coast. A reference to Marco Palace in the Asian Journal of Thomas Merton notes that he studied entomology also at the University of Liverpool, and undergraduate records which I studied show that he first registered in 1913 as a general student of zoology and didn't take any examinations. The following year he registered again but this time as a research student in the Faculty of Science and again as this was a research program there were no examinations, no formal exams and so he left Liverpool University in due course without taking a degree. Not that that mattered. His scientific training, brief as it was, helped him to write in Peaks and Llamas his best-known work, excellent descriptions of the butterflies and moths he had observed in the forest of Sikkim's tropical zone during the monsoon. Marco admitted, having spent some weeks in the forests of equatorial South America, I was expecting to find the jungles of the Tista Valley north of Kalimpong, where, as we'll discover, he spent three years later on. Equally prolific, since the rainfall of Sikkim is enormous, some 120 inches in the outer ranges. The trees, however, were on a markedly smaller scale, and themselves were perhaps half the size, and didn't produce the stately cathedral-like impression of the more highly developed rainforest. In 1915, Marco joined his brother Andreas, who you see there on the left-hand side of a <coughs> rather beautiful painting by Marco's sister Marietta. 
Andreas, Marco, and Eric. I think Vivian is that right? Yes. yes. That's good. But he, Marco joined Andreas at Nice in eastern Serbia, where he learned to speak Serbo Croat. He explained Andreas's presence in Serbia, remarking laconically he was always drawn towards the Slavs. That year, Marco assisted the Dutch Salvation Army Colonel, Colonel Govar, I think it was, bringing aid to stricken communities along the shores of the river Sava. When the Colonel returned to Holland, Marco joined his eldest brother Alec in Macedonia. He was commissioned as a second lieutenant and served in intelligence as an interpreter. In 1916, an attack of malaria led to acute inflammation of his right eye and he was taken for treatment to Malta. In England the following year, he worked in the Foreign Office Censorship Department before applying for active service in the Grenadier Guards. After training as a machine gunner, he was drafted to the Western Front, and during the Battle of Cambria in 1918, when two of his senior officers were killed, Marco was shot through the knee. By the time he recovered, the war was over. Curiously enough, I just heard that one of his greatest dreads in the First World War was that he might have come face to face during a battle with a young German friend, another musician friend of his, and that he would find this man wearing the German uniform and he would wonder what to do. After the war was finished, the two friends met up, and believe it or not, the German friend's first words to mark him were, my greatest dread, my dear friend, was that I should meet you wearing a British uniform somewhere in the field of battle. So they had thought exactly the same thing about each other. By contrast, in the Second World War, uh, Marco, who was by then in his 40s, served as a special constable with the Liverpool Police Force. Lady Nichols says that on Marco's 21st birthday, his father gave him £50,000. But according to Marco, this was two years later, in 1918, <coughs> after he had been discharged from the army, but a lot of money in 1918. The lavish gift made him financially independent, enabled him to study music and indulge his newfound enthusiasm for mountaineering. Frank, or Freddie as he was sometimes called, Spencer Chapman wrote in Helvellyn to Himalaya in 1940, Palace is a lover of all forms of art. For some years he's been working on an opera, composing the music, writing the words, designing the costumes. He's particularly interested in the viol and the harpsichord. The opera, titled Ihlava, as far as I know, was never staged. Spencer Chapman added that Marco did not take up mountaineering until he was over 30, and then, after several seasons in the Alps, he led an expedition to explore the Gangotri district of the Himalayas. From 1925, Yes, from 1925, music and mountaineering became his greatest passions. This is one of the series of sketches, again done by Marietta, of Marco playing the viol. Let me just run through them so that you get this. Another one, very good. Let's leave it on that for a moment. From 1925, music and mountaineering became his greatest passions. Despite his doctor's advice that he might never walk again, Marco travelled in the Arctic with Augustine Courtauld and as a member of the Wayfarers, a Liverpool club devoted to outdoor activities including mountaineering, he climbed in the Peak District, Scotland, Snowdonia, before venturing as far afield as the Dolomites and Switzerland. Marco was very sociable and he often invited <coughs> members of the Wayfarers to his family's impressive house at 28 Birth Drive. While Julia Palace was intemperately fond of her son, she insisted that his climbing associates must be confined to the basement, where Marco had a room and worked on his opera and other compositions <coughs> at an upright piano. She used to say, I think, too, and they occasionally spoke to each other in French, and instead of saying, <coughs> we mustn't have every Tom, Dick and Harry, in the nicest possible way, in the drawing room in my house, she would say, Papier, papo, c'est un casse 
Pierre et Paul. <laughs> They're rather nice. Paris was easygoing, but also very tactful, except for meetings of the wayfarers. Dominic Nicholas records that he usually got his own way, but without friction. We know from Mabel Dolmetsch's memoirs that Marco had begun to study the viol and the harpsichord with Arnold Dolmetsch at Hazelmere in 1920. At a concert in Liverpool after the war, Marco had met Cyril Goldie, an art master and cellist, who had played for Dolmetsch and talked very persuasively about his instruments and his efforts <coughs> to revive early music. As a result, Marco invites the Dolmetsches to give two concerts in Liverpool, which by chance included Cooperarium's masterpiece, Qui Puo Merarvi. Years afterwards, Marco wrote that hearing this for the first time was enough to determine the course of his entire life. The English lutenist, John Cooper, had changed his name to Giovanni Cooperario in the 17th century after he visited Italy. It's no surprise that Cooperario's rhetorical Kipu Mirarvi, which translates approximately as Who can prevent me looking at you? appealed to Marco, whose unfettered and inquiring mind was one of his greatest virtues. Mabel Dolmetsch had expected to be greeted at the railway station by some portly bearded business gentleman who was astonished to find Marco, a slim and boyish looking young man, but lately demobilized from the army. After his first concert, when Cyril Goldie praised the tone of the beautiful viol that Mabel had been playing, she handed it to Cyril while Marco announced calmly, It is yours. That night Goldie hardly slept, getting up at intervals to touch the vial as proof that he hadn't been dreaming. Marvelous thing to have done. Can you imagine? In 1920, accompanied by the tenor William Doran, Marco spent most of the summer at Hazenmere. His inheritance had helped him to buy a whole chest of vials into whose technique he was initiated with a view to eventually building up a concert of vials in Liverpool. He also paid for a new studio workshop built on the site of a ruined stable where the Dolmetsches had kept goats. To his delight, Marco had the chance to improve his rock climbing skills, helped by the brother of Elizabeth Brown, who had married one of Dolmetsch's workshop assistants, Robert Goebel and she was one of the earliest recipients of a Dolmetsch Foundation scholarship in 1930. So having been taught to climb by Betty's eldest brother, or elder brother, Marco encouraged Betty during her years at Hazelmere as a keyboard student of Dolmetsch. She recalled, Marco Pallas had already taken up the cause of early music, and under his sympathetic influence, my own leanings in that direction received fresh impetus. Soon I was learning the viol and taking part in my first consorts. Robert Donington, a brilliant disciple of Dolmetsch, writing in his obituary years later of Elizabeth Goebel, said she was a protégé of Marco Pallas, who did so much for so many of us at that time when he was a leading supporter and we were hopeful pupils of Arnold Dolmetsch. Writing in the Dolmetsch Foundation's annual The Consort in 1954, Marco may have had his father in mind when he pictured Arnold Dolmetsch as fiery and intolerant of any views that clashed with his own. Marco wrote, there was no room for divided opinion in his proximity. His affection for the Dolmetsches reflects, I think, very clearly his devotion to his own mother and father. His fondness for Mabel was only surpassed by his admiration for her husband, whom he worshipped as a genius and a visionary. Scholarly, successful, liberal, sentimental, Alexander Pallas had dominated his large and diverse household. And in 1935, as he lay dying, surrounded by his family, Alexander commanded Marco to read aloud Plato's account of the death of Socrates. 
When Marco had finished, Alexander spoke his last words, Finito e la musica, a quotation from Pagliacci, worthy of the patriarch's theatrical demise. Alexander, who had not been ill, was, according to a relative, simply bored and looked forward to death as a new experience. <laughs> Quite remarkable reading Socrates, Plato and Socrates to your father. Strong. Julia Pallas gave Marco encouragement and generous support. When she died in March 1940, almost exactly five years after her husband, Julia left her estate divided between Marco and his brother Andreas. And do forgive me because I'm not a great friend of machinery, nor is it me, and I always forget to work these things in solidarity. Whereas Marco, orderly by nature, had tolerated without hardship his mother's strict regime at Tatoi, Andreas, in stark contrast, was chaotic, improvident, and charmingly unpredictable. He lived in the Willow, in a nondescript house surrounded by a wild, untended garden, and there he worked as a silversmith and a goldsmith, aided by disciples producing beautiful sugar bowls and elaborate church ornaments, including a magnificent ciborium, a cup with an arched cover, used for the reservation of the Eucharist. Andreas was kind-hearted, but too trusting and wasted a fortune that his father had given him on his apprentices and friends who sadly took advantage of him. When he grew old and infirm, only one of these friends offered any help at all, and Marco, though deeply appreciative of the offer, refused it and himself bought Andreas and Nyote. It's possible but as yet unconfirmed that in 1923 Marco may have visited India, although it's recorded as early as 1923 that he'd first climbed into bed, Mark Oral Stein, in his review of Peaks and Lamas in February 1940, contradicts this. Stein wrote that in spite of Mr. Pallas's knowledge and learning, the authorities have so far always refused him permission to enter the country of his affection. He expressed a hope that the clear merit of this book may cause any future application by Mr. Pallas to enter Tibet to be favorably received. The Second World War prevented him from doing so, but in 1947, Marco and Richard Nicholson at last fulfilled their joint dream of visiting Tibet shortly before the Chinese invasion. When Marco led his first expedition to the Himalayas in 1933, when he himself was about 38, he and Richard brought their vials and played them in the evening in camp. The beauty, peace and challenge Marco found among the mountains offered its own reward. However, the pursuit of adventure for its own sake in these remote places gave way eventually to a spiritual quest which occupied him for the remainder of his life. This quest, defined so perfectly in his own words, implied intellectual detachment allied to a disinterested seeking after knowledge. How this transition occurred is described in Marco's wonderful book Peaks and Lamas, which was published in the same year that the Second World War broke out. In the epilogue, Marco tells us what his book and the journeys it describes had meant to him. For myself, the writing of this book and the two journeys that led up to it, he said, have been a single voyage of exploration into a land of uncharted glaciers and unclimbed ranges, the mountains of tradition. From far up their slopes I glanced back, and in contrast with my surroundings, the prospects of the lands which I have come, from which I have come seem dismal indeed. At the outset of my story, I tried to climb peaks in a bodily sense, but in the end, I discovered the Lama, who beckoned me upward towards immaterial heights. 
Before they left England for India and the Himalayas on All Fools' Day, April Fools' Day 1933, Markham and his four companions, Richard Nicholson, F. E. Hicks, Charles Kirkus, and Dr. Charles Warren, had made preliminary sorties to Ben Nevis, Snowden, and the Valet, where they tested sleeping bags and tents and all sorts of other equipment. Richard, a son of the famous yacht builder and a fellow musician, had accompanied Marco on climbs in England and Switzerland. Hicks, in Marco's view, represented the ideal of the all-round mountaineer. Kirkus was among Britain's finest rock climbers, <coughs> and Charles Warren, an experienced alpinist who later acted as a medical officer on several Everest expeditions. Lastly, Marco described himself as rather older than the others, with a number of alpine seasons behind me and an affinity for Oriental, especially Indian history and art, dating back to early childhood. It was, he observed, a reasonably strong party and even-tempered, a thing which counts for a great deal in the wilds. Of their preparations, Marco noted that nothing was taken on trust. As a result, there were no serious mishaps when the hour came. Starting at Magra in May, they followed the pilgrim route to Gangotri, where peaks rose on every side in wildest confusion. Not even in Sikkim, Marco wrote, have I seen anything like the mountain scenery round Gangotri. Kirkus and Warren, unaided by porters, climbed the 22,000-foot central Santopant peak, an outstanding performance that involved a rock pitch a thousand feet below the summit, which, as Marco wrote later, would have been considered severe at sea level. Marco was fascinated by local legends surrounding another peak, Rio Pagel, in whose ascent he shared. The twin peaks were held sacred by Tibetans, and almost exactly a century before Marco's expedition, two Scots brothers named Gerard had ascended to within 3,000 feet of the summit. A remarkable achievement at that time. A pious lama, it was said, had reached the summit, 22,000 feet, and four villagers in quest of sapphires had found the higher peak to be one huge sapphire which they carried away before a terrible storm destroyed them all. With a quiet humour so typical of Marco, he remarked exactly how the incident of the second party came to be reported in all its details is unexplained. Above Rio Pagel's summer pastures, where cows and sheep grazed among pale mauve delphiniums and blue gentians, a chaos of ice and shattered rock turned Marco's thoughts to death and impermanence, a theme that appeared highly appropriate to these desolate surroundings. The stones which remain, he wrote, they too are gradually dying. Death is not an appanage only of the living, nor are the living alone in being subject to death. In this is to be seen the pattern of all things. Thus would muse the Tibetan hermit, a lama whose invisible presence shadowed Marco throughout his mountain wanderings. Standing with Charles Warren on the summit of Rio Pago, Marco had felt the whole 22,000-foot mountain lying beneath his feet, and yet, at that very instant, came the ghostly lama's reproof. Whose feet did I hear you mention? How can you talk of your feet when there is no real person in the name of you? There exists indeed a certain bundle of mental and physical properties, temporarily associated, ever-changing, and soon they will be dissolved again. Which of them will then keep the right to say that he was Marco? The spirit voice continued, You have not conquered Rio Pago, for there is no Rio Pago either, though there exists an aggregation of stones and bits of ice called, purely for convenience, by that name. If there be no vanquished, there can be no victor. There can be no true achievement as long as there persists the slightest hankering 
under individual enjoyment of its fruits. If you don't realize that, why then do you climb? Following his expedition to Gangotri, Marco was acted, elected a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society at a meeting on the 2nd of December 1935, when the mountain explorer, whom I knew very well, great friend, Eric Shipton, read a paper on the Mount Everest reconnaissance. Eric, some of you might remember, took the famous photographs in 1951, published in the Times, allegedly of the Yeti, the abominable snowman. He told me the story, he assured me that everything had happened exactly as the pictures relate. Spencer Chapman's Hervelian to Himalaya contains insightful, if occasionally inaccurate, cameos of Marco as a linguist, a mountaineer, and a musician. The value of these recollections is disproportionate to their length or content, not least because such information is exceedingly hard to find. They derive from Marco's 1936 expedition with Spencer Chapman, Jake Cook, Robert Rofe, and Richard Nicholson to the Zemun Glacier in northern Sikkim and their subsequent attempts to climb the two great peaks of Sindhu and Sinyorchu. On most evenings throughout the voyage from Liverpool to Visagapatam, south of Madras, Marco and Richard played their vials, and Spencer Chapman recorded, I shall always connect the tune green sleeves with the diaphanous wings of flying fish and the unreal staged scenery-like mountains of the Red Sea. The expedition porters carried up to the mountains these precious instruments whose beautiful sounds permeated canopied forest valleys, hillsides, and starlit plateaus of the Tibetan borderland. In Gantok, the capital of Sikkim, <coughs> Marco learned to his intense disappointment that the Kanchen Jonga district being sacred to Buddhists, there was little hope of his party being allowed into Tibet, and that attempts to climb Sindhu or Sinyorshu might be forbidden. According to Chapman, the news depressed Marco so much that he took to his bed with a high temperature, and a week later he still looked very ill, but was by then strong enough to trek to La Chen. Marco himself wrote in Peaks and Lamas, it was a great blow. All our plans were in the melting pot, but he didn't mention either that he had felt depressed or ill, but instead expressed his gratitude to the Maharaja of Sikkim for his kindnesses and emphasized how much he owed him personally. But a chance remark had made him aware, the Maharaja that is, of my cherished desire to embark on a genuine study at first hand of the Tibetan doctrines for their own sake and not out of mere scientific curiosity. Marco felt greatly reassured when the Maharaja spoke encouraging words, which he wrote later, I have not forgotten. In 1936, Marco was already a practicing Buddhist. In 1947, when he was finally permitted to travel in Tibet, he was initiated into one of the Buddhist orders. And thereafter, <coughs> he was known as Tubden Tenzin, Tubden La, or sometimes tradition, since he had insisted upon using this word for any system of belief such as Hinduism or Christianity, in his view termed incorrectly as religion. Richard, it appears, had been initiated at Shigatse at the same time as Marco, and he was known afterwards among Buddhists as Tukdil Shirup. In early April, Marco and his companions heard that the plant hunter Kingdon Ward and Ronald Colbeck had upset the Tibetan authorities, and as diplomatic ties between Britain and Lhasa were fragile, it was vital that nothing should be done to strain them further. Although Marco was given permission to visit Zemu, it seemed unlikely that he would be allowed to enter Tibet. At La Chen, high up in the Tista Valley, they visited the abbot, who had spent many years in mountain retreats. An aura of power made Marco at once feel that here was no ordinary mortal. So enchanted was he by the valley that he thought it wicked to hurry through this naturalist paradise 
wearing a vivid blue flag catcher with enormous butterflies and moss, zigzagged and fluttered among ancient trees festooned with creepers, orchids, and brightly coloured nameless or unnamed flowers. Others of his party, including Chapman, fretted in their eagerness to reach the high snows, loomed over by Simbu and Sinyochu. But Marco urged them to be patient, to take it easy, build up their strength. And yet, beyond La Chen on the Zemu Glacier, when a truculent squint eyed porter tried to intimidate Marco into breaking the ascent and pitching camp, Marco would have none of it. For as Spencer Chapman noted, he hid a good deal of determination behind his mild character. It's true, I think. In general, however, writes Spencer Chapman, Paris had such a horror of reducing his servants to a state of servility that he erred in the other direction and spoiled them unreasonably. At first the weather on the Zemu Glacier stayed fine, but soon this was followed by days of mist and snow. The party, though frustrated, proved to be good-tempered and patient, especially Marco, who had received word that very day as they planned to start up Simbu that Spencer Chapman had been invited by the British agent at Gyantse to establish a school at Lhasa or to accompany the agent to Lhasa <coughs> as his private secretary. Soon after, the agent, B.J. Gould, confirmed that for various political reasons he could not give permission for Marco to enter Tibet. As Chapman wrote, here was a fantastic situation Pallas, the leader of the expedition, who knew as much about the language and customs of Tibetans as any man in Europe, was not allowed to enter the country, while I, who knew nothing whatsoever about Tibet, had been invited to go up to Lhasa itself. Pallas was violently opposed to the idea of starting a British school in Lhasa, thinking as he did that the Tibetan way of life and culture were incomparably superior to Western civilization and he considered it would be a most presumptuous act on our part to start teaching Tibetans how to live. It says something for Marco's magnanimity that in these circumstances he and Chapman remained on the best of terms, even about 20,000 feet. While searching for routes up Simbu, Marco's party climbed two lesser peaks, one evidently a Bavarian peak, judging by the neat masonry of the cairn found on the top, suggestive of German thoroughness. In the evenings they sat round big fires and amused themselves by devising different dishes for supper. Marco's contribution, a ravioli made of eggs and sugar with brandy instead of marsala, proved simple to make and, as Marco remembered, was acclaimed by all to be a great success. Approaching La Chen on the way back from Simbu, they saw masses of rhododendrons, one with scarlet flowers like tiny bells, another with snow-white blossoms clustered 40 feet above the path on a mossy pine near a delicate mauve orchid. Bushes of flaming orange azalea lit the entrance to the Tister's torrent valley. The breathtaking sight reminded Marco of the words of Emperor Shah Jahan, builder of the Taj Mahal, if there, if there be a heaven on earth, it is here, it is here. While he had a profound respect for... Now, would you like, shall I tell you what the photographs are, or, or is it just all right to... This is actually one of two photographs, one of which became the frontispiece for peaks and llamas, and uh, Marco very kindly gave me the unused image. It's of uh, a monastery in Ladakh. This is the Zojila, very beautiful, rather reminiscent of Scotland, but on a completely different scale. I'll leave you with that for a moment. While he had a profound respect for good scholarship, <clears throat> Marco's modesty forbade that he should be described as a Buddhist scholar. Yet a scholar he was, and a great one. Peaks and lamas 
is made of a prose that never strives towards self-conscious literature. It is as refreshingly direct as the writer, and it radiates the beauty insight requires if it is to be effective. This also was the view of Houston Smith, who found no past or present writer on Buddhism to surpass him. Of course, Marcus' directness and apparent simplicity was the distillation of a lifetime's meditation and learning, founded partly upon teachings of the Herbert Abbot of La Chen, who instructed Marco as he had instructed Alexandra David Neal during her early Tibetan studies. Of the pilgrims and the abbot, <coughs> Marco could not help contrasting the pilgrims' childlike and unsolicitous trustfulness with the abbot's extreme intellectuality and knowledge, the latter albeit gained largely by withdrawing from the world and watching it from without. At Tangu, his street retreat high above La Chen, the hermit abbot once inquired, why did you go up to Zemun and try to climb the snow mountains? I would know your true purpose. When Marco told him for love of their wild solitude and to avoid the bustle of towns, the abbot replied, you will never find it thus. It cannot be won by such methods. The solitude to seek is the concentration of your own heart. If you have once found it, it will not matter where you are. Marco then reminded the abbot how Milarepa had sung the praises of mountain and wilderness, recommending them to those who wished to master the art of solitude. If Mila, who aspired to Buddhahood within the span of a single life, had found the undistracted atmosphere of mountains helpful, Marco ended, can we be blamed for wishing to escape the turmoil? Sometimes. While Marco had never intended to compare the mountaineer's love of solitude with Milarepa's retreats, or those of the abbot of La Chen, knowing that to do so was either blasphemy or pure romance, he felt nonetheless that he had kept his end up, if only just. Milarepa, the Sinatalan saint, fascinated Marco increasingly and inspired an opera he left not quite completed at the time of his death. In 1936, Richard and uh, this, I should tell you what these things are, forgive me. This is a, a farm already, uh, a Ladaki, who um, I think they had quite a lot to do with in one of the journeys, I think probably in 1936. And this dramatic scene is, is behind Spituk, which is a desert country high and wild. And the axe at Gartok, a turkey caravan. The axe doing what the axe do. Good possessor to my old friend who travelled on Lack the axe and ponies in the dark, I should tell you, in nineteen eighty three. Uh, was very he didn't like horses much, he preferred camels. He'd always travelled in Arabia. I asked him what he thought about yaks. He said, that's the ludicrous creatures. He said, either they do nothing or they rush off with their tails up in the air like periscopes. <laughs> but I think he was being a little bit uh, one-sided. That lovely photograph of Marco in the middle <clears throat> with his ponies and with uh, Richard, I think, there, on the Chang La. La, of course, being a pass, a high pass. Very evocative and beautiful, I think and a bridge over the Indus on which I believe the registrar of the society Louise has seen two llamas jumping up and down like a trampoline. <laughs> I leave this one, this is Piang, is that right, Dario? Piang Gompa, Piang Monastery <coughs> in uh, Ladakh and um, it's, in the ter it's in the country where eventually Marco and Richard studied. Let me go on with this, and this will tell you a little more about it. I'll be as brief as possible, then. Marco and Richard planned to stay at monasteries at Lobrak, near the Bhutan border, and there receive Buddhist instruction. At Lobrak, the great divine St. Marpa was born, who became the spiritual guide of Milarepa, the 11th century ascetic Tibet's national poet. 
Unexpectedly, instead, they were instructed at Pian, at the other end of the Himalayas, by one of St. Martha's spiritual descendants. This teacher, Gonchok Gyaltsan, whose name translates as Banner of the Most Precious Things, came from a peasant family in the Pian Valley. And the order of lamas to which Pian adhered was a branch of the Red Kargupta, or the Oral Tradition Order, which traces its descent back to St. Marpa of Lobrak and St. Milarepa himself. Gyaltsan was a gifted artist and calligrapher who painted traditional tankas and copied religious books. And watching him, attended by his 12-year-old novice, Marco imagined himself in the workshop of a master Jerome or a Fra Angelico. At Piang, Marco reprised his discussions with the abbot of La Chen on Milarepa and Alexandra David Neal and investigated the art of Tumor, pursued by the Red Kargupta. Clad like Miller in nothing but thin cotton or repa, monks living in retreat among the glaciers kept themselves warm by inducing bodily heat from within. According to Marco, Madame David Neal was the only European who had discovered how tumour was done and could put it into practice. At Le Chen, and more frequently in Ladakh, Marco found no evidence of resentment towards missionaries of other creeds who lived and worked there. He was told, we are taught that it's a sin to speak disrespectfully of other religions or to treat their ministers in unfriendly fashion. He read unequivocally in Peaks and Lamas, hatred, masquerading in its newfangled dress of righteous indignation against error, found a way of playing yoke fellow to Christian love. The resurrection of bigotry followed close upon the resurrection of Christ himself. The invaluable instruction Marco received from Gyaltsan at Piang was further perfected by the Reverend Dr. Wang Yao, a Mongolian from Lhasa who visited Marco in Liverpool in 1937. With Lama Wang Yao, he read the Lam Rim, or Stages in the Path, the main doctrinal book of the Yellow Hat Order, the most influential in modern Tibet, into which Marco and Richard Nicholson may have been initiated at Shigatse the previous year. Wang Yal accepted readily and uncritically the New Testament parables, parables which illustrated points of discussion. Christian parables greatly appealed to him, and of Christ he said, I see that he was a very Buddha. In his later writings, Marco often discussed issues of importance to Christians as much as to Buddhists. Of his essay entitled, Is There a Problem of Evil? He wrote, it occurred to me that it might be more rewarding to tackle a subject which Christian minds notoriously may have found troublesome by applying to its discussion a characteristically Buddhist dialectical technique. Buddhism does indeed figure in that essay, but only incidentally, along with other traditions. During his visit to England, Lama Wang Yao always wore his national dress, a gorgeous garment of crimson brocade with gold trimmings, varied only by a somewhat incongruous Homburg hat. Mabel Dolmetsch swears that it was a bowler hat, but either way, and tan shoes of English design. Marco took Wang Yao to the 13th Hazelmere Festival, where he translated for the Lama who had learned English in China and occasionally needed Marco's help. He explained that in Tibet, music was looked upon as one of the four paths to wisdom, and Marco remembered Wang Yao's astonishment that sacred and secular music were not regarded by English audiences as dissociate or separate things. When he heard Cecil Dolmetsch singing Rosa das Rosas e Flor das Flores, which is a 13th century Spanish cantiga in, if you like, in adoration of the, of the Virgin Mary. And this accompanied by the medieval harp, organ and viol. Wang Yal exclaimed, that is the kind of music which our musical angels play. Now, if you'll forgive me, perhaps you'll be grateful to me, I think I might start to short circuit some of this, which will appear, I believe, in the middle way at some point. But let me sort of get down a little further. 
nearer the conclusion. Let's run forward to 1947, when Richard and Marco managed to travel in Tibet, as they'd always wanted, and after they'd finished their journey, they returned to Kalimpong, and there they lived until 1951. To a novice monk, Orgyan Sangarashita, we owe a description of Marco's home life at Kalimpong. He and Richard lived there in a secluded bungalow surrounded by shrubs and trees and approached by a flight of rough stone steps. Tibetan painted scrolls hung on the walls and the polished wooden floors were covered with Tibetan rugs. There were silver butter lamps on the altar and massive copper teapots on the sideboard, all gleaming in the shuttered semi-darkness. In one room, he could just make out the unfamiliar shape of a harpsichord. And but for the stone steps, Sangarashita might have described the house that Marco and Richard shared for a time in London with a pink rhododendron in its small garden as a perpetual reminder of the Tista's paradisal valley. Very quickly at this point, as I was telling uh, some of Marco's family earlier on, I was vastly amused <coughs> to be reminded that a uh, Although Richard Nicholson did refer to Marco in so many ways, in a very friendly, but in a very natural, easy way, just over one thing he didn't, and apparently some roses of which Richard was enormously proud, inordinately proud, which grew in the garden, was stricken by green fly. Marco, of course, didn't have care of anything being destroyed. One day when he was out, Richard went round the roses and got rid of the green fly. And when Marco came back, went down and looked at the flowers and came in feeling rather pleased with himself and said, Richard, I told you they've all gone naturally. No need to do anything to them. The story was never revealed. <coughs> in 1965, Marco was appointed professor of vows at the Royal College of Music, a position he held for ten years. He did a great deal beside to arouse wider interest in early music, both as a performer and a writer of articles such as the instrumentation of the English Viol Concert. He favoured Arnold Dolmetsch's precept that style and content of any music represents the wisdom aspect of it, whereas techniques, including the necessary apparatus, represent method. Accepting that music requires its own individual technique, whatever it is, Marco believed that to this truth Mahayana Buddhism has given concrete expression with its teaching about the indissoluble partnership of wisdom and method. In 1951, Marco and Richard established the English Concert of Files, which they had begun informally in Oxford around about 1935, playing with Richard and Margaret Donington, quite informally. And of course, this was disbanded during the Second World War. <clears throat> it was the first professional group of its kind in this country to give concerts in so-called stately homes, besides playing for audiences in London and in cities in the United States. <clears throat> Meanwhile, Marco continued to compose. The string quartet in F sharp was published when he was 89, and his moving, moving and beautiful Nocturne de l'Ephemere, translating roughly this, even song of the Mayfly, or the Mayfly's Even Song, inspired by a poem written by his brother Andres. It was performed at the Queen Elizabeth Hall just before his 90th birthday when he went on stage to accept the applause with his customary modesty. Afterwards, after Marco and Richard left their house in Edgerton Terrace in 1978, they lived in Switzerland and Cambridge before they finally settled in a small flat in Chesham Place, just a few minutes' walk away from Sloane Square. Marco devoted his last years mainly to composing his opera based on Milarepa, subtitled A Spiritual Drama in Four Parts, using the text translated by Jacques Bacot uh, of the biography of Milarepa, with inevitable adaptations. Marco divided the first and second parts of his vocal score into three and seven tableaus. The score was described and arranged in French. 
and to be appreciated properly, the opera obviously must be heard. Although one can convey some impression of the music, which is very beautiful, in words, this is necessarily limited, and I think it would take a talent such as Philip Hesseltine, who you may know better as Peter Wardock, who was Frederick Delius's amanuensis in the 1920s, to conjure something like that. While the vocal score presents as a finished work, Marco left drafts of Menorapa's orchestral score and fragments of it, suggesting that he might have had in mind revisions to the opera, which he was never able to complete. Marco Pallus died very peacefully in Surrey on the 5th of June 1989, a fortnight before his 95th birthday. Richard Nicholson and two other close friends were at his bedside. Richard survived Marco for more than five years and died early in 1995. A friend and disciple of Marco, Peter Torbert Wilcox, established Friends of the Centre in order to study the middle ground shared by the major religions. Its activities include the Marco Palace Memorial Lecture, which explores aspects of his Buddhist teaching and is held annually at the Royal Academy of Music. Marco Palace's long life itself was a celebration of the marriage of wisdom and method. He believed implicitly that by living out this truth, both as contemplation, when one can fairly call it wisdom, and practically as method, one can be brought to the threshold of that mystery of which the Buddha has unlocked the door. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.